There are so many ways to work with cloth and thread. There are broad categories like quilting and garment sewing. Then you can niche down into various techniques like applique or embroidery. And then you can niche down even farther and niche down even farther. My next guest, Meredith Woolnuff, has done just that. She creates stunning sculptural embroidery with thread and wash away stabilizer that are intriguing and unique. And she's gonna tell us all about her journey. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea and here's my interview with Meredith Woolnuff. Welcome Meredith to the show. Where in the world are you coming to us from? I'm coming from Australia, Newcastle, Australia specifically. And that's near Sydney, right? Yeah, it's about two hours north of Sydney. It's on the coast. It's a beautiful place to live. And are you originally from Newcastle? No, I'm not an Overcastrian. I'm not allowed to call myself that because I wasn't born here. I'm originally from Sydney, so suburbs of Western Sydney. And I moved up here about 10 years ago now. Do you come from a family of makers? I come from a family of definitely creative people or artistic people, but not necessarily visual arts. We've got a lot of musicians in our family. My mother is very creative. She's also an artist. My father's very practical. He was a carpenter. So, you know, he's very good with his hands and problem solving. And I feel that that's also a huge skill when it comes to makers. So yeah, I think I do come from a family of makers and creatives. So you have a very interesting niche within the sewing world. You're into sculptural embroidery. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. and how did you find your happy place? It was kind of a happy accident. I have always been a maker, as I mentioned, always been creative, always been arty. So I went to art school straight out of high school, very fresh. I was 17, wasn't even old enough to go to the pub. And I majored in textiles when I got there, even though I didn't have a background in textiles or sewing beyond, you know, the basic you know, little crafty kit or something. I just found it to be a fascinating area because it's so broad and there's so much to learn there. And I went to art school because I wanted to learn all the things. I landed in textiles and loved it. And then, but didn't really find my thing until I got to my honors year. So an honors year is like an extra year of studio study, an extra tack on year to year degree. And I decided to focus on freehand machine embroidery on water soluble fabric. And I just thought that was a really interesting combination of technique and material. It was something that we were very briefly shown, but no one at the university did it. No one that I knew did it. So there was no one to help me or mentor me. And I literally just fumbled my way through this weird technique with an ancient sewing machine for a year, made all the mistakes, but also fell in love with the process along the way, because I just saw it as a way to essentially liberate embroidery from its base cloth. I could do a drawing with my sewing machine and then I could wash the fabric away. So I was just left with that sculptural drawing, that lace-like drawing. And I just thought it was so exciting and I haven't stopped since. So that was 2006, I did my honours degree. So 16 years ago now, I guess. The time goes on, you do the math and you go, it does. really? <laughs> Yeah. So you had just sh been shown it briefly. What was it that attracted you to doing an honors and something that you had so little exposure to? Yeah, great question. So yeah, we were just shown it briefly and I saw it as an interesting way to draw. I actually used to take my sewing machine into life drawing classes, which I'm sure everyone else hated. I just thought for the honors year, I wanted to give myself the opportunity to explore something deeply. And I, I think I just thought there's potential here. There's creative potential here. I feel you could take this technique and these materials in so many different directions. And I just purely wanted to explore that. And the honors year was a great opportunity to do that um, because I probably didn't have the confidence at that point to think about launching off and becoming an artist, particularly if I hadn't found my thing yet. So I wanted to give myself an opportunity to hopefully find my thing. Thing. And thankfully I did. Did you need to produce so many pieces of work? When you're at art school, it can get a little bit vague about what it is you actually have to produce. Um, but really we had to produce a written paper and then we had a final year exhibition. So I spent the year doing lots of experiments, lots of uh, process work. And then I did eventually build up to a series of works. They were like huge hanging hanging things, um, sort of circular patterns with all these hanging threads off them. And then this other piece, which was like lots of small bits of embroidery that were pinned to the wall in this lovely sort of dancing uh, pattern 
of embroidered shapes. It was the starting point. My work's probably quite different now, but there's still elements from that first project and that first year that have carried across into my practice today. So how important is choosing the right thread? So yes, choosing the right thread is of course important. Really all you need in a thread for doing this type of technique is it needs to be nice and strong. It needs to be able to run through your sewing machine and not snap every two seconds. That's really the only criteria when it comes to thread. Otherwise you can choose whatever you like. I personally work with polyester machine embroidery thread because it's lovely and strong, it's archival and it's got a nice luster. But I've had students use regular cotton threads, metallic threads, beautiful thick woolen threads, anything you like, as long as it's not snapping all the time and driving you crazy, it's the right thread for the job. How about rayon? Yep, rayon works well as well. The most machine embroidery threads will be rayon or polyester. Um, I personally have had more success with the polyester. It's just a slightly stronger um, fiber than rayon, but there are some great rayon threads out there that work really well. And how about the needle? Needles good, important too. When it comes to a needle, you just need a, a nice sharp needle. My personal choice are jeans or sharps needles. And uh, you obviously pick the size of the needle to suit the thread. I find I have more luck with a sharps needle over something like a universal because it just has that sharper point than a universal. A universal needle is slightly blunted and um, it just doesn't do the job as well and it doesn't last as long. Now I'm looking through your gallery of pieces that you've done and there's a lot of them with a nautical theme. Is mm -hmm. that because you like the shape, the symmetry or your proximity to the ocean? Probably all three, if I'm honest. I have always been fascinated by the ocean. I'm a keen scuba diver and I dive whenever I can. Has been harder to do since having kids. I've always just been found the creatures in particular that you find in the ocean really interesting and beautiful, particularly coral. I've always been drawn to coral. I find it so fascinating and beautiful. So when I first started moving away from the type of work I did in my own year the first series that I actually did was a series of nine circular coral structures that was back in 2009 I think and I've just I've been stitching coral ever since the fact that I do live close to the ocean definitely influences on that it's lovely to be close to the ocean um, but yeah I just find it a fascinating world the more I learn about it the more I want to learn about it and the more I want to explore it and express it in my work as well because you're working with real things like coral and fruit and things like that, do you feel that you have to work in particular colors, like accurate colors? No, no. As an artist, you get to play God a little bit, don't you? You get to play with color. Um, it depends on the subject, but I often push the colors beyond reality. And I think that also comes from the fact that the color thread that I'm working with is often so vibrant and bright. So you've got this very rich palette to work with. And it'd be a shame to just work with all the muted tones. So often my colors are pushed and exaggerated, but it really depends on what it is that I'm depicting and whether I want to try and get close to the real color or whether I want to make it a bit more fantastic and fanciful. It, it really just depends on the project and what I'm trying to convey. So I don't see any garments or quilts in your Instagram feed. Do you no. make any <laughs> of them and they just don't get on the feed or you don't make them at all? I don't make them at all. That's really not my area of expertise. I have attempted a quilt and like many quilters, I'm sure it is a half finished project. It's something I started to make for my first daughter to go on her bed. She's now five. Um, so probably doesn't want the alphabet quilt that I started, but maybe it'll get done for the second. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's not really my area. I love it. I have so much respect for it. I seem to get surrounded by quilting artists and I'm in awe of what they do, but it's just not my world. I saw that you were just teaching a class at Bernina, Australia. Are you a Bernina mm -hmm. ambassador? Yeah, I think they call them friends of Benina over here. I'm so impressed with Benina, the company. Everything I've had to do with them has been very impressive. And um, yeah, so they've involved me in a number of their events and invited me to be a part of their Benina Academy, which they just ran, um, which was a wonderful honor. Love to do anything with Benina. And of course, I work on Benina machines. They were the machines I learned on and I uh, just find them to be especially good for the techniques that I use. So let's talk about your classes. Do you have both mm -hmm. online and in-person classes? Yes. Yes, I do. It's nice to be back to the in-person classes now after what feels like a couple of years of, of nothing there. So yes, I do teach 
in-person workshops and I do really love to do that. It's so nice to meet people and teach them face-to-face. So my online classes, I love because it means that I can now teach people from all over the world. I don't have to travel all over the world and I can still reach and connect with people, which I love. So I have an online school and I have a number of courses there. There's a free course that anyone can enroll in at any time that just introduces people to freehand machine embroidery. So it gets them up and drawing with their sewing machine. It's a lot of fun. Then I have a a larger, more involved course called Sculptural Embroidery, and that's where we explore freehand machine embroidery on water-soluble fabric. So I essentially share everything that I know and love about this technique and all of the ways that I've developed to work. I run that course twice a year. And then I have a third course, which is all about the way that I mount and frame my artworks. It's called Framing Textile Art. And uh, the way that I present my embroideries is very important because I feel that really brings them to life and makes them very precious objects. So many people struggle to present delicate textile artworks well and archivally and safely. And I have a simple but still quite nuanced method for doing that. So my Framing Textile Art course is where I share that particular method. I actually find, well, obviously everybody finds this because your your work is so popular, but that mounting it so that there's a shadow of your work mm. uh, behind, so effective. Oh, yeah. It just brings a whole nother dimension to it. I actually call it shadow mounting. That's the name that I've given the process. And uh, yeah, it just... It, it takes it to the next level because I found that I was creating these beautiful, delicate lace-like embroideries, but then when it came to presenting them, or more importantly, when it came to selling them, if I was to just put it flat on a piece of fabric, they lost some of their magic. You couldn't see their lace-like nature. So I went to great lengths to develop this way to mount them so that you do get those shadows and they do just look like they're floating in the frame. Yeah, I think it's a special thing and it's, it's so indicative of my work. I think it makes everybody go. (gasps) People like even even on the weekend at the Benina Academy event, you know, I had some pieces there and people are getting in and they're like, but how is it floating? Is it squished between the glass? And how are the shadows? Some people actually think the shadows are like drawings. They're like, oh, so there's a pencil drawing behind like a shadow. And you're like, no, 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 that's just a shadow. And it draws people in. It makes them want to look closer and look deeper. And I absolutely love that. That's exactly what I want people to do. Now, when I first contacted you for this interview, I'm not sure if you had just left or you were just leaving on a big yep. tour of Northern Australia. How was it being away from your sewing machine for so long? Oh, it was fine because I had a family and an adventure to keep me busy. <laughs> but I, I must say, I did miss it. it. It got towards the end of the trip. So I, I had four months, four months traveling with my family in a caravan, seeing a beautiful part of this country. It was amazing. It was inspiring. But I was itching to get back sewing and making and creating I did have a little project. I did a little illustrated journal while we were traveling that kind of like ticked over that need to be creative and to make something. But yeah, it did feel good to be back in the studio. I just like walked in on our first day back and it was like, oh, I'm back. (laughs) Welcome home. It felt good. (laughs) Traveling with children can be demanding and tough. How did you bring creativity into that adventure? That's a great question. Yes, it's a joy to travel with kids, but it is a lot of work and it can be draining. I really wanted to make something on the trip. I wanted to, you know, keep feeding that side of myself. So I decided I was going to do an illustrated travel journal. So rather than just taking a thousand photos that I would never look at, I had come with a beautiful little watercolor sketchbook and I brought my my fieldwork drawing kit, basic watercolors, pens, pencils, that kind of thing. And I set about creating an illustrated journal rather than just a written journal. So I would take notes of all the places that we'd been, things that we saw, you know, photograph things that might make good little drawings. And then when I got the time, which wasn't all that often, this was not something I was doing every day. Sometimes I'd have weeks that would go past and I wouldn't touch it. But when I got the time, it was so nice to sit down and to draw and to plan out how the page was going to go and to do some little paintings and to build this book. It became something that I was very proud of and that um, my kids were interested in. They kept wanting to look at the book and, and it was a really nice break from the trip. I would really only do it or break from the chaos of the trip was it was part of the trip. I'd really only do it when my youngest daughter, she's um, she turned two on the trip. So she's still little, she still has a day nap. So when she would have a nap and I'd have to sit in the caravan with her while she was napping, that's when I would work on it. And it was just sort of me time 
and it was it was a really nice break and a necessary break I think. Have the events of the last two years changed the way you work? Yes and no. I think we were very lucky in that the whole COVID and isolations and everything didn't affect me too much because I work on my own anyway. I go to the studio. My studio was within our little bubble that we could travel in. Thankfully, my children were still able to go to daycare, so I could still have my work days. But really the biggest impact was probably the push to get me into the online course world. It was something I'd planned to do for a very long time, but huge amount of work. And, you know, I just never seemed to get there. But of course, not being able to teach workshops, having all my workshops cancelled meant that I had to move into that sphere. And I'm so glad that I did because it's been so enriching to teach online. I didn't think it would. I think it would, wouldn't be as special as teaching in person, but there's still such a great sense of community and I think that's been the biggest thing to come out of the last few years, and I'm very thankful for it. Zoom is interesting. One, I can talk to you. You're on the other side of the world, and it doesn't. It truly feels like you're just across the room. Yep. There's hardly <laughs> any delay in anything, and you are able to meet all these people and teach these people from all over the world. But then there's just that something extra that you learn in the class mm. that we've been missing. Yeah, then nothing beats being an in-person class and having that instant help if you need it. And that, you know, I think also the the community aspect, it's the chatting over morning tea. It's the other people talking about the other things that they do and sharing their own knowledge because they feel more comfortable doing that. Yeah, you just really can't beat that, can you? And there's the exchange of ideas. Oh, I tried that. That didn't work. Or here's my my, my needle. Try this one. That cooperativeness, I think we've been Absolutely. missing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I always find, I always learn something new when I teach a workshop. It might just be a little trick that one student has or another tool that I've never seen. There's always new things to learn. There's always new ways of doing things. And it is that communal exchange that happens in an in-person workshop where that, that magic just happens. It's great. So do you find that your favorite colors have changed as you, you've worked with your, your thread? Yeah, I think they have. If you look at my early work, they were all red and orange and that was that warm toned world. That was just where I landed. Now I feel I'm doing a lot more in the beautiful sea greens and cool blues and purples. And I tend to be working in that series a lot. And you can actually see the progression of my colors because I have a glass bowl that sits on my sewing desk where I put all my thread scraps every time I lock off. So it's sort of like a timeline of my sewing adventures. So you, you see my first bowl because I fill up a bowl and then I just get a new one. Um, and it's all, you know, those earthy colors, reds and rusts and, and browns and muted greens. And then the bowl that I'm currently filling up is, yeah, swells of purple and blue and yellow. And yeah, it's kind of nice to see. <laughs> That's a cool idea. You would have like the threads would be stratified by project. Yeah, 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 yeah. That it builds up. That's exactly right. Like sedimentary stone, but this beautiful, colorful, the red library of my little, it's like a little timeline. Yeah. 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 Fill it with cool. epoxy or uh, glass. And <laughs> you yeah, it could. forever. Do you have a favorite piece of work? Oh, that's like asking me if I have a favorite child. Do you have um, a favorite child? <laughs> 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 I think there's definitely pieces that I'm proud of that stand out and they tend to be the ones that were particularly challenging or push things to a new level. So for example, I have a, a really big curled gum leaf, big scribbly gum leaf piece that was the largest single piece I ever made. It's over a meter in diameter. It's not framed. It's actually pinned directly onto the wall. And it's actually in a gallery's permanent collection up here. So it was sort of a landmark piece for me because it was the biggest piece, single piece I ever made. And it was also one of the first pieces to be you know, purchased by a gallery and become part of their collection. So that was sort of a an epic piece for me and still one that I love. I haven't made anything bigger than that since. Another piece that I am particularly proud of is also another big piece. It's actually bigger than the scribbly gum leaf I just mentioned, but it's made up of many, many pieces. There's over 400 pieces in it and it's a huge circular arrangement. It's a piece I'm very proud of because it was made for an exhibition that's quite a, it's the most important textile art exhibition here in Australia. It's called the Tamworth Textile Triennial. So obviously it happens every three years and artists are invited to participate. And it was just very different for me to create a work 
for that type of exhibition because the majority of my work gets sold to people that love it and want to put it in their home. And I don't tend to do a lot of big gallery shows as a result. So it was a really great opportunity. So that's a piece I'm particularly proud of as well. It's one that's called The New Neighbours. So you mentioned size there a second. It was your biggest one is just over a meter. Do you think you're going to challenge yourself ever to do anything bigger? Possibly. I would love the opportunity to. I, you know, you're always looking for that next level, that next step. For me, though, the problem is time. <laughs> These things, unfortunately, take a long time to do. And I have a, a commission wait list that goes to halfway through next year, as well as hopefully planning for a next solo show. So it's just finding the time, plus life and family and yeah. All, all everything else, um, I kind of feel like I'm chasing my tail a bit, which is a great problem to have as an artist, to have too much work. But there's always ideas bubbling away and I have plans for bigger and better things when I get the time. So how hard is it to say no? Oh, really hard. <laughs> I've never been very good at saying no. Oh, I try and do everything. I try and please everyone. And then I get myself into a bit of a bit of a state trying to meet all the expectations. But I must say, having kids taught me that I have to say no, because it's not just me in the studio anymore. You know, I have to make time for them and for the family and try and get that mysterious balance right. I don't think I've got it right yet, but I'm getting better at saying no. Need a bit more practice, but we're getting there. There is no balance. I think the... the (laughs) I'm so glad you acknowledge that because sometimes I feel like it's an impossible thing to try and get right. (laughs) We, especially as women, believe that there's a balance between family, work and life. But the thing is, one, your children are constantly changing. And just because they become adults doesn't mean they don't stop changing. (laughs) (laughs) what they need you for is constantly changing plus just life in general is changing I think that the world has now realized there's no balance there's no fitting it all in the the key to it all is subtraction and just pulling it back Mm -hmm. to what you really prioritize and need to get done absolutely and if anything I think the last few years have taught us that we need to be adaptive plans change things come up And we just have to go with it. And I think people are a lot more accepting of that now after the last few years, which can only be a good thing. And the value of renewal and filling your bucket and how important our crafts are to doing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that was why the trip that I took this year was so important. You know, the idea of taking four months off work, you know, is kind of terrifying, but it was so necessary for that whole renewal process and resetting. And as I said, to come back refreshed and renewed and, and, and ready to get stuck into it. Sort of in this sculptural embroidery, it's such a small niche. Is there such a thing as traditional and modern within it? If there is, I don't know about it. (laughs) I feel like the term sculptural embroidery is probably just You know, I use it, maybe some other people use it as well. It's the title of my course. I feel it describes it well. This type of working is really just a fancy version of machine darning, which is very traditional. Freehand machine embroidery is essentially darning with your sewing machine. I've just pushed it a bit further. Uh, Water-soluble fabric, of course, is used very commonly and very traditionally for machine embroidery as a stabilizer. So the use of material is very common, but just the way that I use it Um, is probably, yeah, much more niche. And the way that I use it is really only a tiny slice of the whole pie of possibilities that you could explore with these techniques. I only work with it on its own with one type of thread to create these sort of embroidered artworks, but it can be a stepping stone to so many other things. And that's something that I love to see in my students' work. They come with all this knowledge and experience in quilting or other forms of textile art, and then they incorporate these techniques into that. Or I've had milliners come through my classes and then use it to create elements for hats or jewelry. It's a simple technique, but it's so versatile. There's so many possibilities. I only work with it in a narrow way. And that's kind of my world, but that's the tip of the iceberg. Even just as we're sitting talking, I'm going, well, how would I would use it? And I'm just mm. suddenly ideas are popping into my head. <laughs> I'll need to sign up. <laughs> Yeah. (laughs) Come join us. It's a lot of fun, but I warn you, it can get addictive. So, so if people want to get a hold of you, how can they reach you? 
Okay, so the best way to get a hold of me, as long as you can spell my name, Meredith Woolnuff, you can find me on the internet. I do have a website, of course, meredithwoolnuff.com.au. I'm on Instagram as Meredith Woolnuff, Facebook as Meredith Woolnuff Artist, and a few other places around, but that's the best way to get in touch with me. And if you want to know about things that I'm doing, workshops I'm running, courses, it's best to just jump on the mailing list. They get all the all the information sent straight to them. And I see on your website, you've got a couple of buttons to join in your classes. Yes, yes, yes. I try to make it easy. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. This is a wonderful, interesting technique, and I hope to experiment with it on my own. Thank you so much. It's been a delight. I hope you've enjoyed my interview with Meredith Woolnuff. Isn't that such a fascinating technique? I had several flashes of inspiration just while we talked. If you are interested in learning more about Meredith or her sculptural embroidery classes, I'll post her links in the description notes below. I'll also put links to her contact info and her social media. Next up on Karen's Quilt Circle is Dr. Jacqueline Adams, and we will be talking about Chilean Arparellas and their makers. You don't want to miss it, so be sure to subscribe. Next time you're in your sewing room, be sure to have Karen's Quilt Circle playing on in the background. I have interviewed so many amazing, interesting people on this show. Let one inspire you. And you can check out my latest video right here. Take care, and I'll see you next time.